This is a presentation of Michigan State University's Knight Center for Environmental Journalism. Hi, I'm Jamal Spencer. Welcome to Environment. In 1859, the campus of MSU was under siege. Every member of the first graduating class and all but one professor were suffering from malaria, a disease carried by mosquitoes. For most of the next century, malaria plagued the world. By the 1940s, DDT had become one of the solutions. Today, the insecticide symbolizes how a solution can become a problem, a problem Rachel Carson helped solve. May 27th marks the celebration of Rachel Carson's 100th birthday. Her landmark book, Silent Spring, is a milestone that launched the environmental movement. One of the main characters in Silent Spring was MSU scientist Dr. George J. Wallace. Tonight. MSU's Knight Center for Environmental Journalism presents a little-known story about a man whose reputation was nearly destroyed by his unyielding devotion to science and nature. Please join us now for Dying to be Heard. Michigan State's campus. The summer's leaves are beginning to turn, and the warm afternoons are beginning to cool. It's time again. A new fall semester is about to begin. As evening comes, the songbirds twitter as they dart to and fro, fluttering to find a roost for the night. The tolling of the old clock on Beaumont Tower is marking the end of another day. But if that clock could magically take us back, back about 50 years, we might notice that change was in the air. It's the 1950s. It's springtime. Many of Michigan State's small songbirds are going about their familiar tasks, little knowing that for many, their lives would soon be over. Something was wrong. A number of dead and dying birds were being found littering the campus. Most were robins. At first it was just a few, but soon the few became too many. Too many to be ignored. One person who noticed was a man with a passion. His name was George J. Wallace a Ph.D. in ornithology, and as the days passed, Dr. Wallace watched. What he saw was what he loved dying away, and he wanted to know why. Dr. Richard Snyder, then a student, remembers. It was recognized that there was a problem on campus with birds dying, and the source hadn't been quite pointed to. There had been some publications in about 1955 that had a link between pesticides and perhaps the robins. And Dr. Wallace latched on to that concept and, and uh, that information, essentially, and began saying, there's something wrong here. Well, yes, there was something wrong. What had happened then is now a distant memory. but some bits and pieces of that memory still exist here in the collections of MSU's museum. It's been over 50 years since these robins were collected on and around campus, but even today as they rest quietly in the vaults of the museum, their silence speaks volumes. Even today, half a century later, they have to be handled with protective gloves. And even today, these few are a stark reminder of a dark installment in humankind's quest for power over nature. These are the few left over from the hundreds that were collected, labeled, and studied. These small birds are a part of history, a part that many say was significant to the early advance of the environmental movement. Today, even though the man and his birds have passed on, their legacies will be remembered. Dr. Wallace taught in the Department of Zoology at what was then known as Michigan State College. 
He was a scientist. He was a teacher. He was a man who many say loved bringing knowledge and understanding to his students and through their work together to the world. These birds were Dr. Wallace's passion. An ornithologist by choice, Dr. Wallace and his students' research into how these robins died would ultimately be cited in Rachel Carson's most celebrated work, Silent Spring. But she picked up on George's publications about DDT and birds, and that's all it took. This became a popular topic, and as the controversy grew, she knew. The reporter mind in her knew she had a story, and she also recognized we had a problem. And she wanted to bring the problem to the great American public and say, look, in your own backyard, carelessness can lead to death and destruction. But even with that recognition, Dr. Wallace and his work mostly remained overlooked. Michigan State's Dr. Jim Bingen recalls his surprise. And um, <clears throat> when, I, when I came across his name and the, the uh, extensive discussion of Wallace in, in that chapter, I thought it should be fairly easy for me to, um, to sort of type in George Wallace in our own library search and um, find you know, any number of publications or at least references and came up with very, very few, which I found quite, quite surprising. After his death, Dr. Wallace and his work faded from official memory. Part of a forgotten chapter, a forgotten chapter that has rested silently along with the rest of the collateral damage. Damage from a forgotten war. It was a war against nature. Originally in the 1940s, the major battle was to kill the mosquitoes that were killing us. And MSU was no different. MSU uh, spread these pesticides on the campus knowingly to knock down mosquito populations. I often wondered why we didn't have mosquito problems here in this swamp in the summertime because MSU, after all, is built on an old swamp. And we have a lot of standing water. We have some old wood lots that have standing water. And every spring, if you just drive down Farm Lane, out there by Baker Wood Lot, you'll see the uh, uh, little ponds on the edge, the vernal ponds on the edge of the wood lot that I collected in when I was 17 years old. And uh, at the time that all of this was coming down, we were putting pesticides in those little ponds to kill the mosquito larvae. And so we use DDT. And I say we, I, I say MSU. But after World War II was over, the battle plans changed. There was a new enemy on the horizon. And the wonder weapon was DDT. They are called elm bark beetles, and they come in two varieties the European elm bark beetle, and the native elm bark beetle. They carry the Dutch elm disease fungus that accumulates on their bodies as they move from infected breeding sites, usually rotting dead trees rich in fungal spores to healthy living trees to feed and lay eggs. Throughout the country, millions of these magnificent trees have succumbed to the ravages of this disease. And in the 1950s, the elm trees on Michigan State's campus were in jeopardy. The university declared war. All of a sudden, to see these magnificent trees begin to dwindle and die one by one, something had to be done. And DDT was used uh, in dosages to knock down the uh, beetle. Modified Air Force World War II bombers flew missions over the campus and began a campaign of chemical warfare. Their objective was to kill the bugs that were killing the trees. We used to have a, a plane fly overhead every year in the spring and spread 
DDT from the air. MSU used to, to have a flyover, we called it, and uh, you would walk down the sidewalks on campus over by the bell tower on those nice sidewalks on your way to the Union for lunch and crunch, crunch, crunch on the sidewalk and people say, what is that? Well, it was clay pellets that had been dropped by airplanes during the early morning hours with insecticides impregnated in it. The news reports were good. We seemed to be winning. Uh, DDT had been in long use, as you well know, it was a lifesaver uh, pesticide. In, in World War II, it was used extensively, even on human beings, as a delousing treatment. And then, of course, in the tropics, uh, it was a um, godsend when it came to killing off malarial organisms and mosquito populations. I think the very first part of the story is you have um, a still uh, a post-war era in which um, um, the pesticide DDT was being very widely applied. It was solving a tremendous number of insect and disease problems. People were, were really quite excited about this. And that sense of excitement began to spread. It was during World War II that a small chemical company in St. Louis, Michigan became interested in DDT. And by the summer of 1944, that interest turned into action. During the war, the Michigan Chemical Corporation began expanding its St. Louis facilities. And by August of that year, the factory was shipping tons of DDT to the Army and the Navy. Killing bugs was big business, and business was booming. By the end of the war, Michigan Chemical continued its expansion. It was dumping millions of dollars into the economy, along with tons of DDT into the environment. DDT was too good to be true. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, during the 30 years prior to its cancellation, a total of approximately 1,350,000,000 pounds of DDT was used domestically. But it turned out to be too much of a good thing. Gradually, things started to change. And in the mid-50s, that's when the Robin problem started to pop up. And they noticed this very dramatic decline in the number of nests and the viability of nests within a, within a two-year period. And they were really trying to put two and two together as to, as to what was happening. And the, and the only commonality that they could find with respect to this nesting behavior, plus reports they were getting from elsewhere around the country, was in the use of DDT to spray um, against Dutch elm disease. Dead and dying birds were all over the campus. The reason wasn't clear. The spraying continued. The link was DDT, right? the DDT was killing the birds. But they didn't know how that was happening because, because DDT is not toxic. It's not acutely toxic to mammals. And so they, knowing that, they sort of needed tests that they didn't even have available to indicate that in fact it was, it was, it was DDT that was causing them. I mean, their assumption was that the birds were being sprayed directly with DDT. It was soon becoming apparent that more than just killing the elm bark beetles, DDT was a weapon of mass destruction. We noticed on campus, and it was undeniable, that our robins and other birds were shaking you would actually see Oh, yeah, oh, right, oh, yeah, I could go to lunch every day and see Robin shaking. they just shake, you know? And then finally they'd plop over dead. DDT had led the pesticide industry down a dead-end road. 
DDT's dark side was coming to light. The only assumption was that DDT was causing this directly. And in part, that was the reason it led to such a firestorm with the agricultural community and <clears throat> the university administrators who were obviously supporting the agricultural community. They, they just did not have a, a direct cause and effect relationship that would stand up in, in front of, of what, the, uh, what farmers were saying with respect to DDT. And DDT was very, very important for controlling pests. This was, uh, this was a major pesticide that was being used. The cause was not known, but the effects were devastating. The birds were dying and a direct link to their deaths could not be found. As time went on, Dr. Wallace's research was at a standstill. They needed to dig deeper. Didn't really have the, the evidence of causality. See, it wasn't until the very early 1960s that they discovered that it was because of the worms and not because of the spraying of DDT that was directly on, onto the birds themselves. And, and the discovery of the worm, the worm connection here was, was almost accidental. You know, they were feeding some worms to, uh, to, some, to some fish in a, in a uh, fisheries and wildlife lab on campus. And um, I think it was fish or crawfish, and they, and they died. When that word reached Dr. Wallace, the research took a new turn. Then they discovered that the worms were, were full of, uh, of DDT. And from there, we got the, um, the concept of, um, of obviously of bioaccumulation or biomagnification. And DDT is one of those wonderful pesticides that manages to biomagnify. That means you apply it to control an organism, but it also hits non-target organisms. And the non-target organisms could be earthworms. Earthworms then continue to eat in the soil where the pesticide is leaching, and they're feeding on ve dead vegetative material and having a good time. But all the time that they're feeding, they're concentrating the DDT in their tissues. And that's when the link was made um, between, um, between the spraying, um, the DDT falling onto the ground, the worms ingesting this, and then the birds ingesting the worms. Now guess who eats earthworms? Mr. Robin. So the robins come along and eat the earthworms. The DDT, which is DDT and DDE, uh, a, a breakdown product of DDT, uh, is then released into the system of the robin and concentrated in the brain and in the liver and in the fat bodies. As time goes on, the animal doesn't excrete this compound and it concentrates to a lethal dose. Wallace and his students had their work cut out for them. I was uh, uh, a good biology student, whenever I found a dead bird, I joyfully brought it into Dr. Wallace, who thanked me profusely, uh, wrapped it properly and immediately froze it. And uh, he had a graduate student, Dick Bernard, who was working with him at the time. And uh, he was the man responsible for analyzing the concentrations of DDT in the tissues of the robins. There were some preliminary papers, preliminary um, seminars given um, at which the pesticide industry did not want to believe the facts. They wanted to blame these robin deaths on everything but DDT. Well, here you had the miracle uh, insecticide and it was now being accused by at least one man on campus here, a scientist who said, wait, we've got a problem and it's DDT. Dr. Wallace's work in trying to find a cause was being noticed, but that notoriety was not making Dr. Wallace any friends. Soon Dr. Wallace found himself in the crosshairs. Former Michigan State University President Dr. Gordon Geyer remembers what it was like. And, and it was understandable why a lot of people didn't agree with George. So it was quite controversial at that time. Oh, very controversial. I can remember my colleagues in the Department of Agriculture and the Plant Industry Division, uh, they never believed Jordan was on the right track.
Wallace was alone. His research was going down a lonely path. Even his colleagues were staying away. What, what they got into at this point in time was basically charges that Wallace was being irresponsible, it was non-scientific, and, um, and sort of the agricultural um, industry, the agricultural community in, in Michigan um, tried to do everything they could to, um, to get him fired. Well, was he criticized? For oh, he was the, criticized to death. By the university? Oh, he was criticized by students, graduate students. Um, there was a division between entomology and zoology at that point. The entomologists chose up sides and decided they would go with the DDT or the pesticide industry. And the zoologists had decided they would stand behind Wallace. And then there were those that stood back and said, we don't understand what's going on. Because I just felt that uh, here was a person who, who went way beyond and took m way more punishment than than he should have had to in teaching in an academic institution. But what do you mean by punishment? How, how well, that... verbal uh, concern uh, uh, indicating he was off base. Dr. Wallace's research was soon becoming as lethal to him professionally as DDT was to the birds. He was laughed at. I was at several seminars where uh, his topic of DDT and birds was laughed at by people who knew better. Michigan Congressman John Dingell provided the antidote. If it hadn't been for John Dingell um, intervening at that point in time, calling him into Washington, testifying, um, and then getting back in touch with, the, with Michigan State University and uh, um, basically threatening future funding from, M uh, from USDA if, if, if Wallace was fired, Wallace probably could have been fired. I mean, I think they, they might have released him because of the tremendous pressure they were under. And part of all of this, you see, at the, at, this, is, this is sort of what makes that decision somewhat more understandable, is that he didn't really have the, the evidence of causality. Uh, the pesticide industry was very powerful. They had been putting a lot of money into research, and rightly so. I, if they're going to use it, they should pay for it. And, and they were certainly l trying to look at long-range effects, but not quite the way the Wallace incident brought him out, about this chain, this food chain that introduced it at one point, and here it comes here. All of a sudden, it's in birds. But eventually the science prevailed. A Michigan State PhD student, Dick Bernard, had completed this thesis on the effects of DDT, and his work proved to be the smoking gun. I've got Dick, Dick Bernard's, uh, I would say, a milestone thesis right here, and it put the cork in the bottle. It, you have to be a complete numbskull to deny the results of this thesis work. 1962 is when he finished it, the field and laboratory studies on the effects of DDT on birds. This was the work that was the damning piece of work. When the results of this thesis were published, we could not deny what was happening. As far as we know, it's going to be with us forever. It doesn't, uh, it does not biodegrade as we know and we continue to find it. Um, mm. I mean, we know that it's, it's in each of us uh, today, so it's, it's going to be in, in, in our children, our grandchildren, and, and their children, so. Wallace did it through Rachel Carson. She quoted him all the time until her death. Um, he, he provided the ammunition. He had his final students and went away. That was it. He just went away. In 1972, Dr. Wallace left teaching at the age of 70. During that spring, he and his wife moved to northern Michigan in a quiet retirement that friends say featured bird watching as a central pastime. The work he and his students had done remains an important part of history. On New York University's list of the 100 most important writings in the past century, 
Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring, ranked second. Her book stimulated the need for more research, and by 1970, MSU's Pesticide Research Center, founded by and under the direction of Dr. Gordon Geyer, opened its doors. As MSU's eventual president, Dr. Geyer recognized Dr. Wallace's efforts with an honorary doctorate degree soon after his death in 1986. MSU's Department of Zoology also offers the George and Martha Wallace Scholarship to graduate students in ornithology. In his autobiography, Wallace wrote, Birds have been my main obsession. I ultimately settled down to a career of teaching and research in ornithology. I have never regretted it. And today, the joyful sounds of spring remind us of that obsession. Michigan State's Knight Center for Environmental Journalism would like to thank you for being with us. Until next time, I'm Jamal Spencer for Environment. This has been a presentation of Michigan State University's Knight Center for Environmental Journalism.